uh, the first uh, influence was that it, in, in uh, Daibler's mind, mind, the influence from Buddhism and Taoism directed the attention away from the mundane affairs of everyday life. Secondly, it, uh, separ it, um, uh, separated the spirit from the body. Thirdly, it denigrated the body and exalted the spirit. Fourthly, it advocated action based on selfishness, believe it or not. That's uh, Diodron's interpretation. And furthermore, uh, it made people prefer non-action to action. And finally, as a result of influence from Buddhism and Taoism, Taoism uh, Diodron argued that, that um, uh, study and learning became despised. The essence of the Buddhist and Taoist influence on Li Xue, as he saw it, was the transformation of Li principle into a subjective entity. In fact, Daidan maintained that Li, as used by Zhu Xi and his followers, was just another name for uh, the Buddhist uh, idea of true emptiness, Zhen Kung, and the Taoist concept, true master, Zhen Sai. This was in, in brief an outline of Daidron's criticism of Li Xue, as I understand it. Uh, let me then also briefly discuss the question whether Daidron's criticism was fair. Was, it, was he correct? Was he justified in criticizing Li Xue in this way? The aspect of Daidron's critique of Neo-Confucianism that interests us most in the context of this lecture is the link he made between Zhuzi's basic philosophical orientation and the oppressive role of Li Xie. Just as André Glücksmann and André Bernard Lévy held Fichte, Hegel, Marx and Nietzsche responsible for the Nazi and communist oppression, so Daidron held Zhu Xi and Li Xue responsible for the oppression in the celestial empire. Now to what extent was Daidron's critique in this regard reasonable? As I have already pointed out, there is no doubt that oppression was often legitimized with reference to the ideas of Zhu Xi and Li Xie. But from this, it does not follow that it was these ideas that caused the oppression or that they can be held responsible for it. For one thing, we can easily find that Li Xie was not only used as a tool of oppression, sometimes it was also used as an intellectual weapon to criticize the arbitrary and op oppressive exercise of the imperial power. The Dong Lin Academy of the Ming Dynasty is a famous case in. Moreover, Dai Zhen refused to make a distinction between Zhu Xi's original ideas and Li Xue as a state philosophy, and this inevitably becomes misleading. He criticized Zhu Xi again and again for regarding Li as if it were a thing received from heaven and embodied in the heart. Again and again, he repeats this phrase. Uh, and thereby making it possible for those in authority to define Li as they pleased. But while this criticism is quite to the point with reference to official Li Xue, it seems much less so with regard to Zhu Xi's original ideas. We all know that Zhu Xi emphasized that man has to investigate the external world in order to acquire the knowledge on which moral action should be based. This was the gist of his interpretation of the phrase Ge Wu zhi zhi, as acquiring knowledge by investigating things. It was also the fundamental point on which Wan Yang Ming disagreed with Zhu Xi, proposing an alternative interpretation which was clearly very subjectivist, in distinction to the more objectivist thrust of Zhu Xi's interpretation. Also in his own life, Zhu Xi was sometimes in opposition to the rulers, even risking his own life. Now, while official Li Xie emphasized the opposition between desires and feelings on the one hand, and morality and reason on the other hand, Zhu Xi did not say that desires and Li are absolute opposites. In fact, he ridiculed the Buddhists for advocating that all desires, whether good or bad, should be exterminated. He even said that human desires exist in heavenly Li. 
admittedly, we must, we, we can find the truth. He said a lot of different things, and they, sometimes they are, he was not consistent. Uh, but anyway, for, for Drusi, it was not, I think it's fair to say that for Drusi, it was not desires as such that were bad. His view was that when desires were selfish, they became, became dangerous. That is the main, main, uh, uh, his main idea in this regard. When, when desires, be, uh, desires by themselves are not bad, but when they become selfish, they, they are bad. So we cannot escape the conclusion that Taidun's refusal to distinguish between officially Xue and Zhuzi's original ideas is a serious weakness in his critique. To get back again to the question of a possible causal relationship between the subjectivism that Taidun perceived in Zhuzi and his Li Xue, it is interesting to consider the ideas of Wang Yang Ming and his Xin Xue, school of mind, the current within Neo-Confucianism, which competed with Li Xie for intellectual hegemony. Like Daijun, Wang Yangming and most typically his radical followers in the Taiju school, Wang Gang, Li Zhi, He Xinyin, criticized Li Xie as oppressive. However, they did not think that it was subjectivism that caused the oppressive function. Instead, they argued that it was by emphasizing that Li is to be sought in the external world, and in particular in the classical texts, that people were fettered and constrained, not allowing them, not allowing people to seek within themselves and on their own insights into the mysteries of life and reality. In other words, Daidon and the followers of Xin Xie shared the view that Li Xie served as an instrument of oppression. Likewise, they derived this function from fundamental philosophical ideas. But whereas Daidon felt that the main error was subjectivism, the others found that the opposite, objectivism, was the main flaw. If anything, this demonstrates the loose connection between Zhu Xie and Li Xie on the one hand, and the oppression exercised in the name of Li Xie on the other hand. Thus, we must come to the conclusion that Daedron's attempt to deduce the oppressive function of the Neo-Confucian orthodoxy as a necessary consequence of the basic ideas of Zhuzi and Li Xie was mistaken. Practice has shown that these ideas were used for diverging and even contradictory purposes. If we now try to lift our eyes and look beyond the boundaries of Chinese tradition again, we may discern some striking similarities between the social dynamics of basic philosophical orientations, such as monism, dualism, subjectivism, and subjectivism in China and in Europe, and the views of these dynamics. Both in China and in Europe, monistic and objectivist worldviews have been used to promote social change. But they have also been criticized for being system imminent and lacking that lever which is necessary for philosophical ideas to be truly dynamic and promote progress. Likewise, dualistic and subjectivist orientations have been seen as offering that ideological lever which is necessary to promote profound societal change. But they have also been seen as preventing social progress by diverting people's interests away from the mundane world, of in or, from the mundane world or by invoking divine authorities to support uh, reactionary values. So what are we to make of this? Can we see in this Sino-European comparative perspective any interesting truths about the social dynamics of basic philosophical orientations? I believe we may at least acquire a clearer and more precise understanding of these dynamics